All right, Kryptos, welcome back to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Um, it's a pleasure to be back and to step in for whomever couldn't make it today and um, to do a part two. Um, you said last time um, that there would be a part two, so here we are, and we're doing a part two on, uh, on propaganda, so I'm happy to talk about this again. Yeah, I'm very excited to have you on. Uh, it won't matter much to my my podcast feed, but I'll be on vacation the next week. And so, you know, a, a few guests had to, to reschedule. And so, you know, Crypto's very graciously stepped in at the last minute to, to make sure that the, the stream of content would be unbroken. And and like you said, you know, after we we wrapped up that conversation, uh, we decided there needed to be a part two. And it turns out it was, it was sooner than expected. So yeah. I'm going to assume that you have listened to our previous episode together. Obviously, you know, that, that's your prerogative, but it will make more sense because we, we've made efforts to not go over the the same ground covered last time. But anyway, Kryptos, I'll throw it back to you. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much. But um, one of the things that we do have to, I think, begin with is um, this notion, and this was one that jumped out at me again, and I think it is worth emphasizing for everyone, is that Propaganda is not something that you address strictly to the masses um, as, as a general like blob, nor is it something that's addressed to individuals, to persons, but it's propaganda is addressed and is um, targeted to what Alul calls the person in the crowd. So you have to have isolated people who are part of mass society. So people who live too far, like distance from each other, who are separated remotely, it's hard to propagandize them. People who are part of thick communities, um, it's very hard to propagandize, propagandize them. So the ideal targets are people who are in urban, suburban situations where they have largely been broken away from thick communities. They live somewhat isolated but yet are part of this mass of humanity and as we talked in last time what propaganda does is it it's a social phenomenon that integrates these people into society and so what he argues we, we talk we mentioned like the christian faith last time one of the things that um, we often talk about in terms of evangelism is you know converting people convincing them one at a time and um what Alul says about that is just too much work to convince people one at a time. So you have to reach them as individuals, but you reach them as individuals in a mass. And that's sort of basically your, your ground for it. And then you more or less use all of the available means possible to. So propaganda becomes all consuming in a mass society. Um, so he lists like a number of things. So you know, it can include things like mass media, but propaganda can also include things like um, censorship. But then he also argues things like legal texts can be a form of propaganda. Proposed legislation can be a form of propaganda. Things like international conferences can be a form of propaganda. Personal contacts. Um, so the people that you know can be a form that you can be propagandized to them. So even things like literature and books become a form of propaganda. Um, diplomacy, in, in like political diplomacy, becomes a form of propaganda. Education is a form of propaganda. Training. So once you're out of school and you're in corporate training, corporate training becomes a form of propaganda. Um, and even things like religion and churches become a form of propaganda. Um, history becomes a form of propaganda. And so what you end up happening is, is propaganda is a social phenomenon that envelops you as a human being, um, the, you, you know, you, the person in the mass. And Elul says, argues that even things like churches become part of the, si the system. And you can see this. We, we've talked about this before, this idea of... Um, you know, the, the regime Christian and why are Christians becoming regime? Well, if the world is hostile um, to the Christian faith or even like neutral and you want to fit into the broader society and feel like you're part of the mass, part of the whole of society, well, 
what happens and the way to do that as churches is you begin to slowly integrate yourself into the propaganda machine. So even the churches, if they want to remain part of, of you know, basically normal society, they also take on the messaging of the regime. So it's this all-encompassing um, reality. And so this is what, this is sort of your baseline for it. And what Alul argues then is that this, this um, cohesive, encompassing and framing reality is built on what he calls pre-propaganda. So you're immersed in a situation where all of the messaging, it doesn't necessarily, we talked about that, how propaganda is not to convince your thinking, but it wants to shape your actions. So you have all of this sort of pre-propaganda that kind of gets you ready to act. And it, it makes you and prepares you and ready to act. And especially in the American context, propaganda is built on um, the social myths of the society. So these social myths are taken apart, they're abstracted, and they're turned into a messaging that then becomes um, part of sort of the background noise of everything. And then actual propaganda uses these myths and then activates you. Okay, so then it activates you towards action. And so people think that, that propaganda is about brainwashing, but really what it is about is directing you towards action. And one of the things that we talked about it as a social phenomenon is that it then integrates you into the technological society. Okay, so one of the things that Alul notes is that propaganda doesn't really change your opinions. And this is a, it's a, it's a weird thing that, that, um, to, to many who aren't used to the subject to, to kind of wrap their head around it. But think about it this way, Jay. So we, we often encounter the type of person in our life. So you meet them on a, on a personal level and you, you have them talk about their life, right? So, you know, they're married with kids. They stay married their whole life. They save money. Their kids go to get educated. So they do all of these things that from the, the way that their life is set up, they live like conservatives and all of their values seem to be very traditional, very conservative, and they act this way in everything that they do. But when the decisive action, when they're needed for society, what do they do? They go out to support the pro-abortion rally. They vote Democrat. They're out there for the Black Lives Matter rally and they've got their fist in the air. And so they're activated even though the, the base in the way that they live their lives and their values, they can, for all intents and purposes, look like a conservative in their life, but the pre-propaganda that lays sort of fallow there becomes activated through propaganda, and then they act in the way that the propagandist wants them to act. And so for me, I think that's kind of the best example to sort of separate this idea of, you know, it's about brainwashing you, when really it's not about brainwashing you, it's about getting you to act in the way that they want you to act. And that's kind of sort of the baseline for, for understanding sort of what propaganda is about. Um, so from there, like when you look at, you know, sort of building on the myths of, of society, um, propaganda in some sense becomes a battle. If you're, if, let's say you've got two battling propagandas, um, because it has to be built on the fundamental myths of society, and especially in America, what you see is that the propaganda is built around who can claim what the true American is. And you see this all the time. So you'll see it among friends of ours on the dissident right who are trying to educate people on, well, what does it mean? Um, C.J. Engel is good at this, you know, educating people on what it means to be a heritage American. So what he's trying to do is to claim the basic myths of America for a conservative right-wing vision. And you've seen this for conservatives for, for decades upon decades, trying to claim conservatism or, or, um, or the American myth for a conservative right-wing agenda. But the dominant agenda is that of the um, progressive left. And so they possess those same myths, those same... Um, core base ideas, you know, democracy, liberalism, um, the, you know, the rule of law, uh, 
all of the idea of the institutions, respect for the courts, respect for, for the democratic process, all these types of things, they build on this. And, you know, they represent, you know, the true bastions of freedom. And they use all of the same language, all of the same myths. They use all the same keywords, but they fill it with different actions. And in a sense, different, um, the, the words and the, the, the action contents that, that result from that are very different than, than what, than, than what the, the people on the right would think. And then you think, well, how can you say that? That's not what true America is. But really, if that's the dominant pro propaganda, that the, the way that the progressive left interacts with the American myths and its core myths and its core foundation stories and if they possess them, then they're the ones who then use those to activate people and turn things. So um, in, in this sense, you know, um, both the left and the right um, really are looking to draw on the fundamental um, organizing principles of the American ethos. And so, but in this regard, if you look at the foundational ideas, the foundational myths of America, well, what is one of those core myths? Well, one of those core myths is this idea of human progress. So we are, you know, scientific progress, technological progress, societal progress. You know, we look at ourselves and we think we're better than the dark ages. You know, you come out of the, the middle ages into the, the Renaissance, the enlightenment, and then modernity, and we are progressing forward and all of the core myths support this. And so in many ways, what Alul argues is that propaganda in the West, in a sense, has to be in many ways, the, the 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 truly effective propaganda ultimately ends up being left wing and liberal because that's the ethos of of the American um, the American system. So I got a couple of of quotes here from my notes, and I'm just going because I think it's important to to hear what Alul has to say on this. So, um, so one of the things that he argues is that you know. It, the, because the propaganda has to align with core myths, he says this, a propaganda that stresses virtue over happiness and presents man's future as one dominated by austerity and contemplation would have no audience at all. A propaganda that questions progress or work would arouse disdain and reach nobody. Um, and so what he's saying is that you, your propaganda is always trying to evoke um, these core myths and these sort of things. This is one of the things that made, as far as a conservative um, a conservative commentator so effective, um, like Rush Limbaugh, is Rush had a good way of evoking these core myths. So, for example, in, in the environment, he would talk about how the left is trying to shut down progress, shut down economic progress, shut down scientific progress. And so he would argue that if we're going to beat the environment, what we need to do is just cut scientists loose, let them figure out how to make money off of cleaning up the environment. And if they can do that, then it'll just basically take care of itself as part of human progress. And so you can see this sort of argument over um, the core myths and integrating them into a counter propaganda to what the regime is doing. And so this is that battle. And as you're battling, you're not battling over like, hey, listen, we need to let go of this idea of progress and talk about personal dim discipline, accepting limits, being finite, austerity, and, and so forth. No, 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 no. Um, you know, it's who is it that's going to be the true progressive. And that's one of the reasons why it's very, very hard to have true right wing politics. So on that note, he says, you know, the political left is respectable. He says the right has to justify itself before the ideology of the left, in which even the rightists participate. All propaganda must contain and evoke the principal elements of the ideology of the left in order to be accepted. And this is one of these things that, that we really have to understand because um, propaganda is part of the tech technological system, which at its foundation was sort of built by the left, for the left, and it's sort of their rules, their game, their system. 
and propaganda is the glue that keeps it all functioning. In this sense, he says, true right-wing pro propaganda really isn't even a thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating turn you've identified. And you've sort of seen this in the recent attempts of kind of big conservative media to make propaganda, basically. Like I cannot remember the name of it, but the Daily Wire released some truly horrific uh, animated cartoon, right? Oh, Where yes. the, yeah. the, the conservative is is played by basically a grumpy dad and he doesn't get his kids. And it, it's fascinating because, you know, it's intended to be a work of political propaganda. But even within that, you know, the conservatives can't imagine themselves as anything other than, you know, sort of the, the grumpy old man in the in the liberals world. And, you know, I, I think it's fascinating that you bring that up, you know, especially, you know, kind of taken in the context of is propaganda an inherently sort of leftist device? Yeah, it, it, and it, and it really is. And that's the thing that, and so in that sense that if you want your conservative messaging to take off, you have to figure out how to put it into left-wing terms. Right. And and this is what I've always said about, you know, in a sense, and this is really, Alul makes the point, you know, where he says the means are more important than the end. And it's like Marshall McLuhan's, um, the medium is the message. So in this sense, the, the, the technological society in its entirety is the true message. And so propaganda exists to keep the Western technological society functioning. Um, and this is why, you know, and I think like an author, you coming outside of Alul, um, senses really what needs to happen, like say Schmidt. And, and he argues that, well, you aren't going to do it from within the system. So it's got to be a force from outside of the system and, you know, um, you know, clutch your pearls, but um, that force is violence. And that's really a lul in the end, like in in other works where um, uh, what is it called autopsy of revolution, and he really argues that you know you almost need a revolution against the revolution, like uh, and and just basically to bring down the whole system. But barring that and the catastrophe that that would be for humankind, because we've grown very used to having modernity and the technological societies around us, that um, that parallel is and building parallel communities that are in some ways separate from the, the 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 system and if you ask yourself well why is it so hard to get people interested in living in parallel societies well because inherently all of the messaging of a parallel society that isn't you know within the the technological society means that you're going to have a life that's harder that is you know um, less financially prosperous um, that it isn't going to have a lot of the conveniences that you want um, isn't going to be all about your happiness. Um, so it, there, there's a whole range of series of things. And this is why people look at it and think, well, yeah, that might be a good idea in theory, but nobody ever actually does anything again, because propaganda is about action. So the, the propaganda system is not only to get you to act, but also to become passive and non-acting. So your passivity in the face of the technological system is, is a key action that the system requires of you is just to accept it and just accept it as this is what it is and not want to resist it. And so that's a key action that the, that the propaganda system um, ends up forcing on you is just your passivity in the face of the technological society that you just simply don't act in ways that are outside of what the propaganda dictates for you. Um, so that sort of explains, I think, some of the phenomenon that you see or don't see and some of the ways that, you know, why building certain types of resistance are, are really tough. And it's really only in some ways inside of the, the kinds of communities that make it difficult for propaganda to take root, which again, farmers, um, because they're, they're rural and separated from the cities but then also tight knit religious communities. So the tighter knit that your, your, your church is, the more likely that your headspace is going to be your own and that you think thoughts like, how can we resist the regime? 
because those are the thoughts that the regime doesn't want you to have. Well, and this is actually a point that you know Younger Younger makes in in the Forest Passage, where he he's specifically talking about a dictator, right, or authoritarian mm. regime, and, and he says that you know even in an election when you're you have the potential to be voting for a strong man or voting against him, you're legitimating the strong man system by voting against it. You know, that is a yes. contingency that the, the system has planned for. And so exactly. when he puts forth, you know, the path of the anarch, which is effectively just to not consent to any of it, which oh, I think is right. a is an interesting path. And and in a way he's like he's correct that that, that really is um your participation in the system legitimizes the system. And he, he's absolutely right in that regard. Um, so that, that sort of, I guess, you know, kind of lays the background for this. But, you know, as, as we look in the early parts of the book, as he lays this background that, you know, propaganda isn't about so much changing your thinking as it is about shaping your actions and conforming you to the technological society, one of the things that he then get, begins to get into is, well, okay, so how does this happen, right? So you are deracinated, alienated, separated from, from real communities. You're hoarded into cities and suburbs. Um, you've, be, you've been made into mass man. Um, so how is it that then the, the propaganda controls your actions? Well, it begins with mass forms of communication, specifically the news is probably one of the primary means of propagandizing you. And it's not the content of the news, but it's the, the, the fact of the news. So what is the news, right? Um, well, the news is a constant stream of new information. This event happened today, this event, next event happens tomorrow and so forth and so forth, right? And so what happens with news is he says this, he says, neither past events nor great metaph metaphysical problems challenge the average individual, the ordinary man of our times. He is not sensitive to what is tragic in life. He is not anguished by a question that God might put to him. He does not feel challenged except by events, political or economic. And so basically what he says is that what happens with the news is that today's item drives out of your mind yesterday's item, and you sort of float in a constant sea of changing sort of images, stories, and so forth. You know, it cannot permit time for thought or reflection. A man caught up in the news must remain on the surface of events. He is carried along in the current. There is never any awareness of himself, his condition of his society for the man who lives by current events. You know, one thought drives another. Old facts are chased away by new ones. Under these conditions, there is no thought. In fact, modern man does not think about problems. He feels them. And this is, in a sense, he says, a man's capacity to forget is limitless. So what the news does is it gives you a constant stream of ever-changing stories that then lock you into a constant presence where you now forget about the past. You don't think about the future. You're not aware of yourself and how you think about the news. You just simply feel the events. And once you sort of just feel about them, um, then the propagandist has you once you're sort of in that sense of the news, because now he can manipulate your emotions, your feelings, your thoughts through the news, through this constant changing, shifting of ideas. And, and he says, basically, what makes news news is not that stories are necessarily even real, but the fact that they're disseminated as news. So the, the objective reality of the stories is irrelevant. And what matters is the fact that they're disseminated as news. And in a sense, we talked about this last time that, you know, propaganda is truth. And this is kind of how that, that happens, that, you know, you're carried along in the day's stories and it's always a new story. You're always just kind of floating along from one day to another with a constant stream of new stories and an ever-present 
um, reality with no past, no future, um, no contact with yourself, and you're just feeling the stories of the day. Um, Elul argues that like 93% of all people, I don't know exactly where he draws the statistic, but this was the 60s and it was one that he pulled up. You know, 90% of all people fluctuate their opinions to the, the, the circumstances. Um, that in a sense, we talk about from a political sense, the, the undecided as a sort of a small slice of society. But he basically argues that other than like 10% of the population, the rest of society are basically the undecided. And they can be manipulated because they have no anchoring foundation that anchors their thoughts in anything permanent. And so they're just kind of swept along. And most of society is just told what to think. Um, yeah. So, and, and actually, it's interesting you, you you bring up the the sort of mode of propaganda, right? That is, you know, no kind of memory of past events. One of the reasons on this show that I very deliberately bring up a lot of current news from kind of ten to fifteen years ago uh, it is largely because it it's. It's interesting to me the degree to which significant news stories can get completely and totally memory hold. So, oh, yeah. you know, just off the top of my head, one of the very interesting things that's happened, and it really happened during the Trump presidency, is the the complete and total redemption of George W. Bush, right? Who is who is Satan incarnate? You know, he was he was a, a war criminal. He was, you know, a, a Christo fascist. You know, pick your poison. Well, now he's just your grandpa who paints. Uh, yeah. Likewise. You know, we, we've seen a very similar thing happen to Mitt Romney, right? If you remember the binders full of oh, yeah. And now, because he doesn't like, you know, the current Hitler, well, well, he's good. But even, you know, more recently, with a kind of, you know, ascendancy of, of Kamala Harris, you know, not only are, are we being told that Kamala Harris is incredibly popular and likable, despite, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what she got, I believe it was 2% of the vote in the uh, primary. She was not particularly popular. Uh, but, you know, at the core of that story is another one, which is even more incredible, which is, you know, we've been told for five years that, you know, not only is, is Joe Biden the most popular president in history, he's also the smartest and the most, you know, mentally capable. Uh, and then, you know, very quickly, we've learned that he is, in fact, uh, an aging man with mental issues, uh, so much so that we need to shuffle him out of the spotlight. And so, you know, your point about the, the kind of the 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 mechanism of sort of suspending memory, I think, is a very apt one. Well, and and with the recent events, I mean, when you think about it, this is one of the things that a little notes elsewhere, is that if you are talking about something, you don't really have it. So, for example, if you're talking about culture as as an issue you know, the culture war, he says, chances are the reason you're talking about culture is because you don't have any. Um, or if you're talking about democracy and the threat to democracy, and you, you know, you think you're battling, or it, the chances, the reason why you're talking about it is that you don't actually have democracy. Um, and the same thing goes, you know, if they're telling you that Joe Biden is competent and the smartest guy in the room. The reason why they're telling you that is because he isn't. So everything that they're telling you now about Kamala Harris, if it were the case that this was who she was, nobody would have to tell you. She would just be it. Um, uh, the, the other interesting, you think of, of like memory holding stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, you think of the arc of the last couple of weeks where um, you have the debate, the, the whole debate process, you know, the debate falls apart. There's all of this scuttlebutt about, you know, what to do about Joe Biden. Is he going to run, not run, all these things. Trump gets shot in the ear and, you know, it's a miracle. All of a sudden, magically, the press are talking about Donald Trump in very sympathetic. Um, you know, he's a statesman. Look at how he's risen, you know, and, and they are, is this a new Trump? And there's all of these, you know, coming from even left-wing sources where there's, you know, a kid glove type of approach to Trump that's something new and something on the moment that Kamala Harris was put in, out comes the old, you know, Trump is a monster, the shooting was faked, nothing is real, all of these these types of, of stories. Um, 
and the, the the switch and now we're back to to normal prop quote unquote normal propaganda where, where Trump is the villain and so forth and all of this happens in an arc of like two weeks and no one is expected to remember that Trump was shot um, no one is expected to remember as you say that Kamala Harris is a deeply unlikable unqualified unserious um, you know not terribly bright person who got her way to the top by having an affair with Governor Willie Brown um how, and how it, dare it, it, you it, how dare you he is no, I'm, a I'm a bad person year after year i don't know how they've managed to do it but they have they have succeeded a a presidential candidate who is more popular than obama more popular than fdr with someone who's yeah. even more popular than that can you believe it? But sorry, crypto is back to you. Oh yeah, no that that video of her dancing and all that. I said, you know, walking out of the Air Force One in three different pantsuits with different sets of high heel, you know, four inch heels on or whatever, right? And you're like, uh, have you actually like listened to her talk? Um, we we can pull you know speeches from her. It, it's it's going to become very apparent that you know even Biden in his advanced dementia, well, if he's still actually alive. Um, that um, even in his advanced state, that um, he's probably still more on the ball than Kamala Harris is, which is, um, you know, and you can't even pronounce your own name properly is, is that's, that's a thing that's worrisome as well, too. Um, but sorry, I interrupted you in a relevant. No, there. and that's, that's why. Yeah. And we're not talking about the news, right? So we're carrying Yeah. But it's, these are good examples that way too. So, um, and, and so this is, you know, this news, though, this interest in the news doesn't happen in isolation. So Alul argues that the interest in both politics and current events is tied to the rise of technology. So the interest in politics and political news is connected to the rise of technology and the expansion of an industrial capitalism and the expansion of mass propaganda. So what Alul argues is that there's a transition from one world into another world and it's facilitated through the technological society and you know, through industry, through technology and through, through um, um, scientism and through propaganda is this shift from a religious world into a technological and political world. So our interest in politics in many ways was manufactured for us by the technological and the technological society and the market economy, sort of the, the, the bourgeois merchant class. So if you think about the world prior to this, and, and this would be say pre-Reformation and even in the early years of the Reformation, you know, what was that world like? Well, it was a world which revolved around um, the Christian faith. So your life was governed by, you know, weekly holidays, sometimes several a week, where you would have religious festivals, religious holidays, religious observances. Your life was was governed by the mass. It was governed by um, just sort of this religious ethos that surrounded all of society, some of it superstitious, some of it being you know, more color within the lines, what we would think of as kind of traditional Christian practice and theology. Um, but there was this basic ethos in which the whole of society is oriented towards, governed by, thinking about its emotional life is dictated, um, and spiritual life is all dictated by um, the rhythms of the Christian faith, its holidays, its celebrations, its festivals, its belief, its metaphysical structure. And with the rise of the merchant classes, with the rise of the technological society, with the rise of industrialization, there is a new orienting principle. You know, so it's life is now oriented around the machine. Life is now oriented around the news. It's oriented around um, mass propaganda. It's oriented around buying things. It's oriented around the idea that you can satisfy all the needs that you used to have with material goods. So all of these base things, and then politics fills the void that all of these religious festivals used to have. So if you take, like Alul says, if you take life in the 12th century and then try to compare that to life in the, the 19th and the 20th century, you're almost dealing with two um, two worlds which are are completely there's a word 
um, that that don't intermingle at all. And, the, and there's a transformation that takes place. So all of what used to satisfy human beings and, and give them satisfaction, the, the life of the community, the village, your friends, your family, your relatives, um, your church life, your faith life, religious festivals, all of that has now been replaced by um, the machine. So you're working on the clock, your pursuit of happiness, your buying of things, um, and then um, political satisfaction, like or being invested in politics and being invested in the news has replaced all of those old realities that, that used to exist. And so Alul argues that all of this is really a feature and a function of the rise of the technological society. So we used to have a metaphysical society shaped by religion, but now we have a society that is shaped by technology and propaganda, if that makes sense. I guess one more. He says it's the focus is so much, it's not so much when we talk about politics, it's not the left or the right, but the 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 focus on politics itself is a form of control that, uh, that the technological, so by being focused on politics, um, you're able to be, that's one of the things that the propaganda wants you doing is being focused on politics. So whether it's left-wing politics or right-wing politics, we talk about you know, the voting process, right? Sort of, you know, like, like Junger, if you go and vote, you're, you're legitimizing the system. So in this sense, our interest in politics legitimizes the technological world, whether we're left ring or right ring, it really in that sense doesn't matter. It's the fact that we're interested in politics. Well, and this is something I think about, right? Because, you know, it goes back to Aristotle, right? Like man is the political animal. And, and there is a, a sense to which that is, you know, always a part of human existence. But, you know, the idea that every single person needs to be involved in politics at all times, you know, that, that it's sort of part of your participation in a civic religion, that's, that's very much a modern idea. You know, and there's a difference between the idea that, like, you know, that humans, when they're around each other, are political. Right. They, they solve hmm. problems, they, they form factions. And then also, you know, you personally need to have an opinion on things happening, you know, all over the world, you know, sort of as they happen, you know, and your vote will be tallied in some great black box to, uh, you know, determine, you know, which octogenarian has enough power to blow up the world. Right. Well, yeah. And, and the thing is, though, too, is that when you're in that Aristotelian Greek city, you're talking about like a... a a scale of life that allows you to have real relationships with real people. And here, as we talked about last time, your relationships are not horizontal with real people. Your, your relationship is with the propaganda, with the system. And so you're integrated into the party or, um, you know, the, these types of, or the action group. And so you feel like you belong, but in fact, you don't actually have any, you know, you don't have relations. Your relationships are abstracted, and they are primarily they are they're mediated through the propaganda and not directly. So yeah, you you know people horizontally, but your horizontal relationships are all mediated vertically through the propaganda, through the system, and your participation in the system. And that's probably the the thing that separates, you know, say like Athens um, of of Plato and Aristotle from the the modern technological Washington environment and, and the North American environment um, or Western environment that way. Um, so at this point, that kind of thing, if, if we keep sort of moving through the material, um, this brings us to the whole question of, of lies, right? And this notion of, of the fact and um, how does he put it? So anyone who is convinced that propaganda is about lies, okay, and that they are capable of determining truth, so that a person is capable of determining truth on their own and able to separate truth and lies, this is the person who is the most vulnerable to propaganda. Because when propaganda speaks a truth to them that they interact with, he is convinced that it is no longer propaganda. 
So the idea is, is that once I've got you to believe something is truth, that the, the whole notion of truth and falsehood fall away. So the, the, if, if this notion that I myself as an individual, I can sort out truth from lies actually makes you more vulnerable to propaganda because once you've believed something, once you've accepted the, the, the propaganda, you now become a true believer. And then anything that would challenge that is a lie. So once you've embraced the propaganda, anything that would challenge your propaganda is now a lie. So this brings the question then, well, what is truth? Well, can't we use facts to separate truth from lies? And here we have to dive into an understanding of, you know, what is a fact? Okay, so most people think of facts as, you know, kind of stuff that happens. It was an event that happens. This is a real thing. It's it's actual reality. And actual reality can check the lies of propaganda. And somebody who has that kind of understanding has no idea really of, of the way it works. So how does reality become present to us? Well, we focus on something. Like if you were to try to apprehend all of reality, you would go crazy. I think there's actually a technical term for that for people who cannot filter out reality. So if you, if you can't shut off some reality to focus on other reality, um, you go mad. So reality is determined by what we focus on. So this thing that we focus on, we think of it as a fact, but really all of this thing is a choice that we've made to focus on this or that part of reality. And so this choice, now that we still don't have a fact yet, he says this choice to focus on this particular piece of reality begins the process of doing fact. So he says now what happens then is that this selection of reality gets elevated in social consciousness. And this is one of the roles that propaganda does. What One of the roles that the news does is it selects a slice of reality to focus on. And then this focus on this particular slice of reality, now as it's elevated into the, con the social consciousness of society, it becomes a fact. Now, once it's elevated and we, we focused on it, we can then now frame it morally. So the reality that we focused on, this is a thing that has really happened. Okay, so the classic example um, that we can use is um, police shootings. So if we only notice police of one color shooting the policemen of another or, or the citizens of another color, so if a white cop shoots a, a black citizen and those are the only events that we notice and we bring those up and we elevate them to consciousness and we let all other shootings kind of fall away, right? Um, and then what we do is we provide a moral frame to that and we, we, and we don't necessarily even have to say it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to even be, sometimes the best thing that you can do is just allow people to, to make the inference themselves, right? The innuendo is better. Let the listener connect the dots. But you give them the sense that the reason why these white cops are shooting black citizens is because of some um, deep-seated racial animus that they have towards them. So now you've created another, and then if you do this over time that you only notice one particular slice of events. So really the, the power in mass media is this power of selecting what reality we're going to focus on and then the moral frame that we're going to give it. So if you come from outside of this frame, it does not matter how accurate your facts are if they cannot be elevated to the conscious, like elevated in social consciousness, they just cease to exist. So in some sense, you get, you know, like a Steve Saylor. Now, Steve Saylor has all these counterfacts that he offers and, and he does wonderful work that way. But unless they are elevated into the broader consciousness, they cease to matter. They don't really, they, they don't actually become facts because they're not part of the reality that is cemented in the minds of, of the citizen who's been, you know, focused on these certain slices of reality. And so really that's, and once you understand a, a fact, 
then you can understand that you don't have to lie to people at all because you can give them accurate information. And in some sense, statistics are even better because you can make context-free numbers do what almost whatever you want, but they're still facts. Um, and things that are untrue, you know, in this sense, and this is maybe where the lies come, things that are untrue but difficult to prove also become very useful in this regard. So um, that's uh, the, maybe the one proviso that way is things that are, are untrue but difficult to prove. Um, but those can also be used to help frame the true facts that you want people fixated on. And this is one of the things that, that people don't understand, like um, like uh, Hitler's propagandist, Goebbels. He always was a rigorous fact checker. Everything that he went out was, was rigorously checked. So we could say, well, you know, it's all truth. Um, and so you then get you know, the way that you can frame things and frame issues. So instead of talking about, you know, killing babies, you're talking about, you know, woman's health. And you're talking about the very same reality. You're focused on a certain aspect of it and you're framing it in a certain way. And so you don't even have to necessarily even lie about things at all, but really, and this is why the regime is very, very worried about um, losing control of a medium like Twitter, because then you lose control of the ability to 100% all the time select the things that are going to be focused upon and elevated into public consciousness. And then you also give the frame. And this is why in many ways the, the narrative is probably the, the most important um, you know, political tool or apparatus that, that we have in society, because it's this ability um, to select, you know, in terms of the news, the constancy of images and ideas, what the people are focusing on in a day-to-day -day thing, you know, day in, day out, just that the, the selection of reality that you focus on allows you to then to determine what truth is. And this is why Alul allows, you know, um, you think of the marketplace of ideas. So if the, if the news is elevated um, and becomes the marketplace of ideas. The winning idea is the one that is truth and the most true. So then, you know, power becomes truth. And if the most effective way to wield power in an information age is through propaganda, then propaganda becomes truth. And this is how, how it happens in that regard. So, Kryptos, we are fast approaching time. If people yeah. want to find you and, and your work, what's a good way for them to do that? Um, they can find me at seekingthehiddenthing.com. That's where I do most of my serious writing. We'll be doing some writing on Alul soon, I hope. Um, and um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's where I do my and then on Twitter at you know at underscore cryptos. Um, just the way it's uh, you know, K R U P T O S cryptos at underscore cryptos. Um, and that's the two places, main places that you can find me. Well, again, I, I'm happy to have you on uh, sooner than expected, but this was a, a, a fascinating conversation. As far as my stuff, you can find The Jay Burden Show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, again, I will say I, I've received quite a lot of reviews on Apple Podcasts, and uh, honestly, they're really funny. So I appreciate you guys for leaving reviews and for, for making me laugh while I'm at work. Uh, so yet, yet again, if you want to support the show, that's a pretty good way to do so. You can also check out our sponsor, Axios. And again, Kryptos, thank you so much for your time, man. Yeah, thank you for having me on, Jay. And remember, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.